you find yourself standing in the middle of a dark, cavernous commercial kitchen. The lights are all off, save for a glowing green emergency exit sign glinting off the rows of polished stainless steel countertops, and a shaft of warm light that comes through the small windows and a double door that leads out to the hallway. You have butterflies in your stomach, but you don't know why. In fact, you don't even know why you are here, how you got here, what you are doing here. All you know is that you feel nervous about what awaits you outside. Ladies and gentlemen, this is an interactive story, and I need your help to tell it. There are a number of pieces of the story that can be interacted with. For example, items that are in the room with us, inventory, known locations. And if people could just shout out what you would like me to interact with next. Envelope. envelope. You find an envelope in your pocket. You don't recognize it. It has a packet of thickly folded papers inside, but in this dim light, you can't quite read them. What is it doing in your pocket? Just then, the double doors burst open and someone approaches. You can just make out white letters on the shirt spelling volunteer. There you are. I've been looking all over for you. They're ready for you. Come on, come on, follow me. Follow, follow. follow right. Emergency exit. <laughs> <laughs> the green letters glow like an illuminated caption of your thoughts. What am I doing here? And more importantly, how can I get out? <laughs> Volunteer. Volunteer. Who's waiting for me? Don't be silly, let's go. He ushers you through the double doors and down the hall to Auditorium A. From the back of the room, you can see the moderator at the podium on the stage addressing a full audience. She seems to be stalling for time. And I see our next speaker has just arrived. Without further ado, I'll turn the microphone over. She steps aside and the whole room turns around to look back at you. Get up there, the volunteer hisses through a false smile. Hallway. <laughs> well, this is terrifying. Maybe you can just slip out the back. Oh, no, you don't. The volunteer snatches your arm and gives you a little shove towards the front of the room. Podium. Podium. Looks like there's no avoiding it. You timidly make your way down the aisle. Up on stage, you turn to face the eager audience. The microphone stares you right in the face. You lean forward. Um, hello, ladies, gentlemen, distinguished guests. Now what? <laughs> I heard moderator. <laughs> she seems fully confident in her capabilities of commanding the room, but the way she glares at you now suggests she is none too pleased with you. Oh, well. Volunteer. He sure seems stressed, and you're not helping. <laughs> envelope. Ah, yes, the envelope in your pocket. Now must be the time. You pull the folded sheets of paper out and flip to the first one. Let's see. <clears throat> Mitochondrial transmembrane potential in apoptosis. Oh, boy, what a mouthful. Well, better give them what they want. Our study focused on measuring altered cellular oxidation reduction. All the eyes are glazing over. That goes on for at least 20 minutes, but finally, you finish the last page. And in conclusion, the study failed to return a significant correlation to the hypothesis. <laughs> no questions? Thank you, great. Half of the audience has fallen asleep, and you slink off stage. At least that's done. Hallway. Hallway. Just outside the main auditorium, where a few stragglers wander around with hot drinks or converse in hushed debates about the previous presentations. Anxious. anxious old man. He looks even more anxious than you, pacing back and forth, sweating and muttering to himself. Don't worry, it's not that bad. You don't understand my speech, my notes. I've lost them. I'm supposed to present in 10 minutes. What am I going to do? <laughs> Envelope. Oh, you mean these? You're welcome to them. You hand over the envelope. Yes, that's it. You found them. You saved me. How can I ever repay you? Don't bother, just a good luck. Well, that wraps that up in a nice little package. But it's still a mystery why you are here. The old man calls you back. Oh, hey, I think you should have this. He reaches into his pocket and hands you something, a sticker. 
wait a minute, that looks familiar. Of course, Elm. It's all coming back to you now. This is ElmConf. You're here to give your presentation, a presentation called Building an Interactive Storytelling Framework in Elm, the End. <laughs> Thank you. So I went to school for a BFA degree in film production. And during that time, I came up with many stories. And some of these stories stuck around in my, in my head, and I would rehash them and iterate on them, try to get them out in different formats and different mediums. And some of these stories have actually been in my head for over 10 years. And I've just been trying to get them out in the right format. Now, during this time, I also grew my career as a software developer. I learned about game development. I learned about functional programming and Elm. And I was inspired to create an interactive storytelling tool that would let me tell these stories that I want to tell. And maybe others could use it as well. I've used a number of other interactive storytelling tools. Uh, there's a lot of very good ones. I'm not going to go into them now. But by using them, I came up with a few design goals of my own. For one, I wanted it to be simple for players. I don't want a command line. I don't want to have to type go north, inspect envelope. I just want to point and click. But at the same time, I want it to be more interactive than just following a branch or another branch. And I want to avoid the clunky mechanics of spatial navigation or object manipulation that just doesn't work so well in a text-based story. And for authors, I want it to be simple to write and ideally, I want it to look more like a screenplay or a manu manuscript than like writing code. You can see from the examples that some of these other tools do that very well. All in all, my main design goal that I would run all my internal questions through was how can I make it as simple as possible to tell stories that are as engaging as possible? And to do this, I decided I would need some kind of framework. And usually, when you're doing a framework, you want to try to get out of the way and do what you need, but let the client take care of what they want to do. In my case, I feel like I want to have a lot of control, given my design goals. Ultimately, I just would like the client to say, here's a description of my story world. Here's a description of how it works. And I'll just take it from there. So I would like to do this in Elm, obviously. But is that, that the right choice? I want it to be a uh, HTML platform, and that includes being able to show it on mobile. So that works. And I believe that the types and the functional nature of Elm would help me write the framework and also make it nice for authors to write their story. And there's some pieces of Elm that could be really useful and interesting, like what we saw earlier from Evan with the time traveling debugger, that idea to roll back and choose a different pathway in your story and even export what you've done so you can save a story for later and come back to it and import it and replay it. Uh, and also the idea of if we can express all these sort of commands of how the story should change as data, I could potentially make a visual editor that creates the data, sends it into the framework, and that would be a really nice experience. But I am curious how the Elm architecture will work with this. When you're building a framework instead of a library or an app, you have to ask these kind of weird questions, like where does main.elm go? Is that in the framework, or is that on the client side? And what about your model, your view, your update functions? Where are all of these? And should you even let your client touch the model? They're questions that you don't really think about. Uh, and I think it will work, but I, I know I'm going to have a little bit of tension because I want such control. And Ultimately, I'm making that decision so that the authors can focus on the story and not worry about the code. So what is an API going to look like to achieve this? And I spent a lot of time thinking about the API, talking it over with other people, and iterating on it. And I'd like to share its evolution with you. So to begin with, I thought of this as sort of a state machine. You have your story, whatever it says at that time. You have inputs, which will trigger a transition into the next piece of the story. And this is kind of what I ended up with when I tried to write that in Elm. I've encoded my transitions and the corresponding piece of the story. And then I have this rather straightforward 
function which looks like an update function, and it just drills down and figures out what transition to do next. It's straightforward, it's simple, it looks like Elm, but there's some things that I don't really love about it. One problem is it looks like code, and I had said one of my goals was I want it to look less like code for the authors. Another issue is I expose the internals of my engine. I, I have them look through the state, and I don't want to do that in case I change it. I don't even want them to have to think about that. And then I also ran into the limitations of a finite state machine. You can see I have combinations of if you're with your umbrella and in a certain location, and if you throw a friend in the mix, or if you're with your friend in the rain but you don't have an umbrella, pretty soon there's a lot of transitions. And so a finite state machine isn't really the best approach. So trying to take another swing at it, I came up with this idea of these declarative rule sets. A rule is like a matcher that says, if you have this condition in the story, then change it in this way. And here's some text that goes with it. And I can group these rules into scenes, and that's this declarative way of expressing how the story works. And this is what that looks like. And I like this. I like that it's 100% data. I describe the pieces of my story and then these rules. And it's relatively simple and clear to understand and come up with, but there are a few trade-offs. For one, uh, I can't ensure that you've written a rule for every case, and you might forget to make a rule for something, and that's okay because it'll drop through to a default handling, which is probably just a description of what you've interacted with which is nice because you don't need to give a rule for every single interaction, just the ones that you want to change your story. But you will have to do a lot of playtesting, and that's probably appropriate if you're authoring a story. Playtest it, make sure you've got the rules correct. Uh, something else that I don't really love about this is those story rules are very dense, very type-heavy, lots of constructors, so perhaps I can clean this up. And I went to functions to create this sort of DSL that makes it read a little bit nicer and a little more like English. And I'm just using functions as glue to put together these, these constructors. And I'm gonna show you sort of the behind the scenes of how that works. I simplified the types into just tuples and then all of these functions are, are constructors for those tuples, but the key is you don't call it with everything it needs. So for example, with the given, it needs all the pieces to make a story rule, but you only give it a couple of pieces and then it returns a partially applied function that's waiting for your advanced story part before it can finish making the story rule, and the same with change world to narrate, and that's how you get there. What was interesting to me I spent a good amount of time just finagling the types, trying to get them to line up so that I could arrive at this. And when I was done, a friend of mine looked at it and said, you know, if you abstract all of your types, you end up with a signature that we know about. And it turns out that change world is curry and narrate is backwards pipe. And I thought it was really interesting and kind of encouraging that this sort of artisanal domain-centered signature that I crafted turns out to be just a normal functional abstraction. As long as we're going down this route, I wanted to get the wording and the DSL correct, and this is what I ended up with in the end. And I'm pretty happy with this. I like how it reads. It feels declarative in its tone. Interacting with the item umbrella when you're in the location swamp will change the world in these ways and narrates this narration. It's not too hard to write. I think maybe even a non-coder could build up a story this way. Visually, it flows down the page well, and I like even how the syntax highlighting focuses which items the rules apply to. And I found that by separating out my content from the logic, it allowed for a nice workflow where I could write all the story text first and then figure out how to plug it together with these rules and potentially you could run that through internationalization or pull it in from another source. So I'm pretty happy with where it turned out. And at this point, it basically works. So all is well and I'm done, except there's a problem. All my types 
my story elements, my items, my locations, my characters, they're just jammed together in one big type. And that made it simpler to figure out how to write the thing in the first place. But I have this problem where I potentially could have a location showing up in my list of characters or vice versa. Or I can say, hey, do this thing if you have the item and then you give it a character. And that's never going to match and it's never going to even tell you that there's a problem. And that's not great. This isn't my quote. This comes from Evan. This is in his sortable tables readme. And I think it's something good to follow. But there's trade-offs to doing this. So I decided if I split up my story elements from just one big thing into items, locations, and characters with a union type, it will allow me to prevent the bad stuff from happening. I no longer have characters showing up in a location list. And it also allows me to give a different type of display information per type, like a location that has a color, whereas an item might not. But it gets a lot more complex. The, the code is a little, I have to handle more of these cases. And it's especially confusing because the framework doesn't know what the concrete types that the author is going to provide will be. So I have all these type variables everywhere. And I need to line them up and make them match. And the compiler is just giving me errors about A, 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 B, B instead of A, B, C, D. And it's hard. And it's a little bit painful. So an alternative could be to let the client deal with that itself, give me whatever config I need of how to deal with it on my end. And that would be great for like sortable tables, which is how they do it. For me, because I want to have this control, I felt the pain but made a conscious decision that I'm OK with having more difficulty on the framework side if it means more simplicity on the client side. I wanted to quickly show you what this code looks like that you might write as an author. And this is the files that make up the story that you saw when I started. In this file, I'm just listing out all the characters that exist in my story world. And I define simple descriptions for them. I do something very similar for the items and the locations that I have. And then I have these scenes with that DSL that I showed you earlier that just declaratively describe how to respond to different events. And there's not too much there. That's about it. And then down below, you can see I have my nice text that I wrote beforehand. That's what an author would need to do. And that's about it. Uh, the, I'm happy with where it turned out. I can make stories. They work. I believe I've accomplished the design goals that I set out to achieve. So I feel pretty good about it. One of the things that I learned, first of all, was that it's hard work really thinking about your API, how you're going to model your state. Uh, I really had to face that and think about it and iterate on it. But I think it got there. And the other thing that kind of surprised me and I liked when working with Elm, when I was trying to push Elm in a direction that it didn't want to go, I could literally feel it pulling back at me. And that's amazing. Like Other languages will just watch you paint yourself in the corner, or they might even encourage you. But with Elm, <laughs> <laughs> with Elm, it's always there, gently guiding you back, keeping you on track. And that's really nice. Even in this case, when I purposefully was kind of shoving against it, that tension was a constant reminder to me to really think about the decisions I was making and if they were worth it for the designs that I had. If you think it should be different or if you have another feature that you'd like to add, it is open source. And I welcome any pull requests. But even more, it's fun to write these stories. And it's fun to read these stories and play them. And so I encourage you to try them out. Have some fun with it. I would love to play a story that you might have that's been in your head. Thank you very much.